that creates huge risk to to people, particularly right in this context, to women, to black women, to LGBTQ people, and others in marginalized positions. Because all the time you have, for instance, say a woman who's a survivor who decides to maybe move to a new city or a new state, right, trying to, you know, I'm going to start a new chapter of my life. And pretty much as soon as you move, these data brokers are going to immediately repopulate their databases with your updated address. And next thing you know, that person that was being abusive or violent towards you can immediately go online and find that updated information and then hunt you down. I am Eugenia Lusky, Lawfare's Fellow in Technology Policy and Law. And this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 6, 2023. In the debate about data privacy and harms, one issue has not received adequate attention by the press or in policy conversations relative to the severity and volume of harm. That is the link between publicly available information and stalking and gendered violence. To discuss how people search data brokers use public information and contribute to stalking and abuse, I sat down with Justin Sherman, who recently wrote a Lawfare article on the topic. Justin is the founder and CEO of Global Cyber Strategies and a senior fellow at Duke's University's Sanford School of Public Policy. We talked about the publicly available information carve-outs, the systemic nature of the problem, and how policymakers should step in. It's the Lawfare Podcast for November 6, Data Brokers, Public Records, and Violence, with Justin Sherman. Before we begin, a quick warning that this episode contains discussions of gendered violence and stalking. Listener discretion is advice. So Justin, I think it would be good to start by providing some background information for those in the audience that may not have read your article yet. So your piece, it's called uh, People Search Data Brokers, Stalking and Publicly Available Information Carve-Outs. So my fairly straightforward question to begin with is, what are people search data brokers and how do they fit in the data broker ecosystem? The data broker ecosystem is a multi-billion dollar global industry of companies involved in gathering and packaging and predicting and then selling data. The sale of data itself is, is essentially the defining feature of this industry. And so Within that, there are different kinds of data brokers. You have data brokers who specialize in selling risk data to insurance companies about flooding and fires and crime. You have data brokers that sell entirely location data. So one of those types of data brokers is what is called a people search data broker. These are also sometimes referred to as white pages websites like Spokio. And what these data brokers specialize in, as is in the title, is allowing you to search an individual person's name on their website, and they will provide you the option to buy a profile of that person, including such things as home address, maybe some contact information like their phone number, maybe their workplace, maybe information about their family, their children, And so uh, within, again, this very large, expansive ecosystem of data brokers, the, the focus on individual profiles and the selling of this data for maybe a dollar or $10 or $20 or $30 a profile really kind of puts these people search data brokers in one of these different categories. So walk me a little bit through the value proposition of companies like this one, right? Because if I understand correctly, a lot of the information that they collect is public. So anyone who would be interested in having this could potentially just get that information by themselves. What is the value proposition? Why would you pay a company for the service? Lots of the data that as you just referenced, that's collected by these people search data brokers is already public in the sense that it's found in public records or government records. So 
what these people search data brokers will do to learn your home address or to learn about your family is uh, among other things, they will go to government records that look like voter registries or property filings or marriage certificates or death certificates or information from departments of motor vehicle. And so in that sense, because you can go to your local, you know, county or municipal government office and get access to property records, or you can go in person and get access to uh, death certificates. In that sense, the information is public, right? Uh, Members of the public can go to a government building and that information is available. The reason that it changes a bit in the people search data broker context and the reason there's a business pitch or a value proposition here in the first place is because the people search data broker has done the work of going uh, to these physical records or getting them from these different government organizations, compiling them together, linking them to specific people and making that available online in a database for searching and for purchasing. And so all to say, right, this is why, uh, as I know we'll get into, the use of the phrase public here is so interesting because yes, in Washington, D.C., for instance, I can go right now to a government building and file a paper request or file one over mail to get access to, for instance, property records, I could learn about information that same way, but I have to go in person. I have to talk to someone at the desk, et cetera. That's very different than having it digitized online. And so that is is really the value proposition that these people search data brokers uh, purport to be making. So now let's compare the process of getting these you know, what you call the, the dossiers from the data brokers, you just mentioned that you can go to, you know, the office in DC, you need to file a request. And that's how you would get one piece of information. How complicated? Or, you know, what's the process? If I want to go to a data broker, I search for the person that I want, what are some of the maybe limits in place? What are the steps that I need to go through in order to acquire that dossier? So let's use Washington, D.C. as an example. Uh, Just It's something I talk about in the piece, and it's it's relevant uh, given where we're recording from, right? So if I want to, for example, get access to criminal records in Washington, D.C., that comes from the MPD, the Metropolitan Police Department. So in order to request someone's criminal history from the MPD, I have to fill out Uh, This is at least on paper, right? In practice, there could be even more barriers. But on paper, I have to fill out a criminal history request. So that includes me putting down my name and other information. I have to include a lot of information about the person I'm requesting from that makes very clear that I know about them already, right? So maybe they've given me their social security number, for instance, through a job application or something, right? So it's not that I'm going in blind trying to find a person that I know their name, but I have more information about them. And then when you uh, go in person, you might also have to provide a police officer with a valid government ID. Uh, And then in general, in DC, when you request public records, you often have to additionally specify the purpose for doing so. And this is just one example, and of course, plenty of folks doing you know, accountability and advocacy work might run into even more challenges. I'm not trying to, to generalize this, but, but all to say, right, going in person to get a government record means going in person to a government building. It means talking to an employee. It means probably being on camera. It means there's a record held by a government organization of who accessed the record uh, and, and whatnot. And so that is a lot of work. That's a lot of record keeping. That's a lot of exposure. And that's really different than going online and searching someone's name and having it pop up that for $10, I can buy 
a profile of this person's name and home address and family members from a people search data broker. So it's really different in terms of the process of getting the data. The one other thing I would add to this is that when you go in person to a government agency to get someone's information, right, you have to know which government organization to go to. And the reason this matters in the people search case, as as we'll talk more about, is there's a lot of stalking and gendered violence that's been tied with people search data brokers. And so if an abusive individual doesn't know where someone has moved to, the physical quote unquote in person solution would be they would have to visit gazillions of different city offices asking for information about someone and having them say, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have it until they find it, right? So a completely high barrier and an unreasonable kind of scenario versus just going online and searching someone's name. You don't actually need to know the city in which they're based or the origin of the public records data because the company has compiled it. So it's it's a very, very different case in terms of the data context and the risk when it's been digitized by these companies. So so that really touches on uh, the the next question that I wanted to ask, which is, you know, how is the kind of the aggregation and the linkage of information contributing to to the gendered violence and stalking that you discuss in the piece? For decades, which really is a tragic length of time to have this happen and have so little done about it. But for decades, individuals intent on stalking people, committing violence against people, have turned to these people search data brokers as a way to learn information about their targets. And the reason they've done so, as mentioned, is because you can go online to these people search data broker websites, you can type in someone's name, and you can, for as low as a few cents, or sometimes for 10 or 20 or $30, purchase a complete public records profile on that person and figure out where they're living. Maybe they moved away from you, right? Where do they live? Or maybe you want to learn where they work, or maybe you want to learn about members of their family and where they live or where they work. And so all of that is very appealing to a violent or abusive individual. On the flip side, of course, that creates huge risk to to people, particularly right in this context, to women, to black women, to LGBTQ people, and others in marginalized positions. Because all the time you have, for instance, say a woman who's a survivor who decides to maybe move to a new city or a new state, right? Trying to, you know, I'm going to start a new chapter of my life. And as soon as you move, unless you, you know, there's all these measures you you could try to take, but pretty much as soon as you move, these data brokers are going to immediately repopulate their databases with your updated address. And next thing you know, that person that was being abusive or violent towards you can immediately go online and find that updated information and then hunt you down. So it, it really, there are other risks too. We can talk about risks to elected officials and others, but uh, in terms of the severity and frequency of the harm, this really is a massive uh, stalking and, and gendered violence problem. And and I want to come back to to this, of course, but before we kind of move on to the next section of the conversation, there is an aspect of this that I, I we have touched upon, but I want to make sure that we're explicit about it, which is the the impact of the digitization of public records, because as you mentioned, the people search data brokers have been around for a long time, but the availability online and the digitization of these public records seems like a more recent phenomenon, right? Yeah, public records have, of course, been, again, available in the sort of physical, offline, whatever you want to call it, form for a long time. But in the past couple decades, brokers people search data brokers have have been looking for ways to collect and digitize and aggregate that data so they can sell it. 
And there are interesting articles from some of the uh, advocacy groups and others working to protect survivors and educate survivors, for instance, in the early 2000s, talking about uh, the explosion of you know, publishing court records and other things online, and then what that enables people search data brokers to scrape, right? Because especially you can imagine if you get a protection order as a survivor of, of stalking or gendered violence against somebody, that could be in a court record, right? So you, you like very quickly, you continue to expose people's information. And that's something for years that that people search data brokers have done when they digitize and aggregate and sell this data on the internet. So as you mentioned, the harms of stalking and gendered violence fall predominantly on women and members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And your article has a very striking example of these harms. You talk about the murder of Amy Boyer. So I, I was wondering, because I think it's, you know, it's hard, but I think it's important to kind of see the steps, the step-by-step play of how access to this information contributed in that case to, you know, to her murder. So, so would you mind walking us through the facts of the case? Yeah. And this is a really, as you said, just, you know, disturbing case at this point, I think, right. It's, it's clear that we're talking about stalking and gendered violence on this episode. I do want to give a slight content warning in the sense that I am going to get more specific here, not in huge detail, but more specific about how um, this woman was, was killed. So uh, in October, 1999, there was this uh, individual who was stalking Amy Boyer, who was this 20 year old woman. And uh, one day she was at work and he pulled up to her car and he shot and killed her and then he shot himself and after this happened right horrific act of of violence and gendered violence it became clear to law enforcement and to the courts that this man who murdered amy boyer had gotten a bunch of information about her from DocuSearch, this people search data broker. So he had purchased her date of birth from DocuSearch for $20. Uh, Then he purchased her social security number for $45. Then he paid $109 to get her employment information. DocuSearch was not able to deliver this to him, and so they issued a refund. Uh, Then he spent $30 to look her up by social security number, right? And he had just bought this. So then he plugged that into a search function, which yielded her home address, which reportedly he already had. And then he spent $109 again to do an employment search right? This is what was refunded the first time. And in this last instance for the employment search, DocuSearch, this people search data broker called Amy Boyer. Uh, The person on the phone lied to Ms. Boyer about their identity and their motives in order to get her to disclose her workplace address. And then they gave that information to her stalker. Um, And so the next month he went to her workplace and he murdered her. So truly a horrific case. It is unfortunately not, you know, a a huge standalone anecdote in that if you talk to any of the national networks or groups that work with survivors today, the same issue persists where people are stalked online. But, you know, what's interesting as well uh, about what happened after this person killed Ms. Boyer is that there was a court case brought against DocuSearch uh, because this people search data broker had provided the information to the stalker. And so essentially what the New Hampshire Supreme Court ruled in this case, Remsburg versus DocuSearch, it was in 2003, was that DocuSearch had a duty of reasonable care to not disclose a person's information to a stalker and that they had violated it 
in the case. So we can talk more about it, but it's an, it's it's unfortunately a very instructive example of the the kind of really grave harm uh, and loss of life that can happen when this information is made so easily available. And it also speaks to the fact that courts and legal experts have been doing thinking about how this creates additional risks to a person and how companies engaged in this practice are uh, doing something especially risky. Did that ruling change in any way how companies, how these data brokers were going about collecting this information? Did it change their practices at all? I would say that it unfortunately did not. And sometimes what you'll hear from these people search data brokers is that they will do things such as telling people when they go to purchase information from a website that this is not to be used for certain purposes. That could include hiring decisions. That's a separate conversation. That could also include saying things like, you know, don't stalk people with this data. You know, to be perfectly blunt, I think that's a patently ridiculous and almost insulting kind of thing to suggest that that's an adequate protection for people who are subject to gendered violence to say that, oh, well, you know, we put up disclaimers that you shouldn't use this data for illegal purposes or, oh, it's actually far too difficult for us to vet every single person who buys because so many people buy home address information that we're just going to going to continue to sell it and we're not going to be able to tell. So in terms of company practices, maybe there are some other legal compliance things they're doing to check the box, but but I do think that you know very little unfortunately has changed since then. I will also say, you know, there the one slight legal change that happened after Ms. Boyer's murder was that Congress passed a law in 2000 named after her called Amy Boyer's law which prohibited uh, companies from selling or publicly displaying an individual's social security number online without their affirmative express consent. This was relevant in the Boyer case because DocuSearch did sell her SSN, but to bring this back out to the scope of risks we're talking about, prohibiting the sale of an SSN is great, but that's very one, one very small slice of the pie, and it of course is not the most imminently dangerous information, which is still available, which is where you're living and where you work and about your family. And so that uh, unfortunately has changed quite little since uh, the DocuSearch case in 2003. Considering that none of this is really new, you know, you've had advocacy for years, you have awful cases that continue to happen. There's even know, an an FTC report that you mentioned that has recognized that data brokers can facilitate harassment. Why do you think this issue is still under addressed? I think for several reasons. I think that as a general matter, right, when we talk about, and I say we, not literally we, but the media and policymakers and especially politicians, when they talk about technology and companies I'll say as well, there's there's often not enough emphasis in any area on protecting marginalized groups as the top priority, right? And this is not a new idea, obviously, but you know, we've seen plenty of cases where companies have released technology that has been conducive to stalking and gendered violence, where there is not enough effort to protect people against uh, the stalking and gendered violence risk. So, you know, in a completely unrelated example, right, like the Apple AirTags is one where as soon as that product came out that you could tag a device or an item and track it uh, anywhere it goes. And the fact that before it even came out, a bunch of folks in the community who work with survivors of gendered violence had immediately said this is going to be used for stalking and there weren't protections put in place and it was released anyway. So, uh, you know, I think there's that factor, right? And so we have to, you know, we can talk about policy gaps and we will, but it's also these people search data brokers who choose to continue doing this, right? It's not some inevitable fate of the universe that people search data brokers are choosing to 
scrape public records and to sell profiles on people, including to stalkers. This is something these companies are choosing to do. And so that I think is one reason that and and the main you know part of the main reason this is still persisted. But then on the policy side, it is disappointing to see you know how little has changed and I think that ties to the challenges of public records and the fact that if this information was obtained privately, right? If if a people search data broker bought it from a mobile app, that would be a very different situation. The FTC might actually have immediate enforcement grounds there if that was done deceptively or but we're not talking about that, right? We're talking about pulling it from government records which are legally considered publicly available. And so that I think is the other real challenge is is you know there's a reticence to touching that and there are plenty of legal issues and and policy issues around getting into uh governing the use of those uh, publicly available information sources by these data brokers. So, speaking of legislative gaps, what do current privacy laws uh, again the US might not have a federal privacy legislation but there are some state level privacy laws that that we might want to discuss. So what do those have to say about publicly available information and how do they play into this entire conversation? Every single state consumer data privacy law in the US has almost exactly, or in some cases, exactly the same complete carve out for publicly available information or government records. This is the case in California, this is the case in Virginia, this is the case in Delaware and Tennessee, and the list goes on. And the way that this is carved out is that these uh, state consumer privacy laws, as you said, especially important because we lack a federal one, are centered around covering a certain type of data. A lot of them use the term personal data. And in all of these cases, they define personal data in a certain way. And then they very clearly state that that does not include information that comes from federal or state or local government records. And so what this means is that in states like California, you have the right for consumers to contact certain companies, including certain third-party data brokers, and to ask them to delete your information. And and, in plenty of cases, they have to do that. And that's great. And California just had a delete act passed that strengthens this process. The challenge is, if you're doing that when the information in question comes from a public record, then it's exempted. So if I, as a consumer, want to contact a people search data broker in plenty of these states and ask them if I can opt out of the sale of my information online, such as my home address, they could choose certainly to comply of their own volition, but they're not legally required to do so because they can say, well, we're getting this from public records. It says very clearly in the state privacy law, the public records are not personal data. Therefore, we are not subject to this requirement. So, you know, that really is a problem because then anytime any company, a a privacy protective company tries to offer an opt out, there aren't enough legal teeth behind that opt out request because of the public records exemption. And it's also a problem in a court setting or uh, plenty of policy settings when this issue was brought up because many people will point to these state privacy laws as the template for consumer data protection and say, well, these laws carve out public records. What are we going to do? We can't go against these laws or we can't you know, deviate from the importance of these records being public. And so what's the difference if these people search data brokers are aggregating it? And as we mentioned, yes, these records are out there. Yes, they're public in some sense, but the digitization meaningfully changes 
the risk. It changes the way the information is available to violent and abusive people. And that just contributes to the stalking and gendered violence problems in the country. So in what is somewhat the flip side of this conversation, right, is the very important role that public records can play, right? especially if you think how they can support journalism, they support the pursuit of accountability. So what are some ways that you're thinking about in which to balance the benefits with the risks that it poses? It's a really important uh, point, and I'm glad you highlighted it, right? Because it is, it is it is true, right, that there are lots of uses of these public records that I think, you know, most of us in any party in a democracy would agree are important, such as civil society watchdogs that might want to review the property holdings of someone that's elected to Congress to look into potential corruption, or maybe a, a local reporter or a national reporter, right, wants to rely on court documents to understand relevant proceedings that are going on. So there are many, many, you know, possible examples we could come up with. And in the piece I cite to, uh, in the lawfare piece, I cite to a recent letter from a number of, of civil society groups that recently made this very point that it's important for journalism, it's important for corruption uh, and other accountability investigations. And, and that's something we have to consider. The argument that I make though, and and you know, which I very strongly uh, think is that we can't let this push us all into a binary, right? Where the binary is public records are great for journalism and accountability. We can't take them down. We're going to do nothing. Or public records are a threat for stalking and violence. They can't remain up. We're going to completely maybe redact them or remove them from the original source, right? That's that's often the the binary that this debate falls into. And this played out very recently uh, over a bill that uh, Senators Klobuchar and Cruz had written to uh, address this issue, although only for themselves and for their staff and their families, um, not for survivors. But we often fall into this binary. And so what I think we really have to do is think about how to separate out the availability of a record in a filing cabinet somewhere from the availability of that information online. Because those are two really different things, right? As we said up front, it's really different for someone to have to go in person to get a record or to not even know where to go to get someone's information versus having a people search data broker do all the work, and then sell it to you in a searchable database. And so I think breaking beyond that binary and figuring out, okay, how can we value the importance of public records for journalism? How can we protect that while also recognizing that, you know, a local uh, a reporter could go to a, a local office, right, in a particular city and get records on a politician for their investigation without us allowing people search data brokers to do this aggregation and sale of data on everyone in the country. I think those are kind of different things. And to the extent we can separate that out, we all might have a better time at valuing the benefits, but listening really to survivors and what they need and the protections that we need to implement. So I I would like to ask you, Justin, now if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what it looks like maybe in practice or how could you imagine that breaking that binary looks like? What sort of changes would you like to see that don't fall into this either or that that you were mentioning? I think one of the most helpful ways to think about this problem that that then changes the solutions we come up with is focusing less on the public records themselves and more on the people search data brokers and their processes. So really thinking about, it's not about the paper that's in a filing cabinet per se, or the file that's on an s- obscure website somewhere, but it's we're going to focus on the process of digitizing, of aggregating, data of linking the data to specific profiles of selling that online. And 
that really, I think, changes the way we frame this problem. Because when we think about the problem as should public records be public or not, that loses the fact that the real acceleration of risk comes from these people search data brokers. And it's not that public records can't still pose a risk. I'm not saying that, but but the digitization and the availability online is what's really made it so much easier for abusive and violent people to learn where uh, their targets and victims live and frequent. And so I think focusing on that process then leads to conversations like, okay, instead of saying we're going to remove public records exemptions from state privacy laws or something, maybe saying, okay, we're going to restrict who is allowed to digitize these records, or we're going to put restrictions on posting people's profiles online for sale, right? You can you can write a law that says we're going to prohibit companies from digitizing, aggregating, linking to individuals, and selling these profiles on the internet, and still allow those public records to exist in the building or the filing cabinet somewhere, right? Those are two different things because there's a very different risk profile posed to people in those scenarios. So I think, you know, focusing more on the tech processes is a really great way to break beyond the binary and think about solutions. Another thing to think about as well is, you know, really emphasizing and listening to survivors of stalking and gendered violence, right? As with any issue, it is incredibly important to and necessary to listen to people who have experienced this firsthand to listen to people who work on these issues and i know i'm talking about this here in kind of my data broker privacy analyst fashion but there are folks who are far more uh familiar firsthand with these issues and those are those are people that uh lawyers and policymakers should talk to to understand their experiences and the last thing I'll mention is Thomas Kadri at the University of Georgia Law School has a fantastic article out last year called Brokered Abuse, uh, and he offers a number of different legal solutions uh, or paths forward as well on this issue, such as accelerating the timeline of taking down information that's online when people are in imminent risk. So there are plenty of things that you know, folks who care about this issue or who want to work on this issue more can look to and plenty of experts and people who have experienced this they can speak with that really will provide paths forward. Now, as we, you know, maybe wait some time until there is a actual solution that addresses the challenge that these data brokers pose, you know, there are there are allegedly ways in which an individual could take steps to have their information removed from the data workers, correct? Yes. There are companies uh, such as Delete Me that are offering services to people where the company will automatically contact people search data brokers for a fee, right? That's the, the business model of these privacy companies. But You'll pay a fee and they will contact these people search data brokers and ask them on a rolling basis to take down information about you. So I think this, you know, for for folks who are particularly worried about their safety, uh, that's something to look into. And then the other thing is plenty of states have, and this will be no surprise, certainly to, to folks who work in this space, but um, who are well familiar with this, but plenty of states have what are called address confidentiality programs. And these are programs where the city or I say city because we're in DC and DC has one, but uh, or the state government will offer a program for survivors of stalking and or, or gendered violence to have their home address and other information changed out in public records. So if you go to the uh, municipal building and ask for a property filing, for example, it might list a government building as the residential address instead of 
your actual home. So the government separately in its own internal system will know where you live, but in all of the state records, they will swap out your address and do mail forwarding sometimes and other things to attempt to protect survivors. So these are also important programs. Folks, uh, if anyone is listening who is worried about their safety or needs to do that, uh, I know we're going to talk more about resources um, that folks can look at as well. But that's something to look up is to look up these programs. But they're also not perfect, right? And you know, there. I think the burden's way too high. In D.C., for instance, you have to submit documentation about you being stalked uh, and some other things, and you can't have moved within the last several, uh, I think, sixty days, maybe. So, you know, I the the barrier I think is still too high. But you know, these are at least maybe band aids on the big gap in the meantime while we wait for for legal changes. Yeah, and actually, I wanted to give you a little space. If there are some resources or organizations or other papers uh, like the one that you just mentioned that you would like to flag for anyone in the audience who might want to learn more about it or who might be in need of that information, I, I think this is a good space to do it. Absolutely. If you Google online, there are resources about this. The nonprofit Privacy Rights Clearinghouse has resources about public records and people search data brokers. Beth Givens, who founded that organization, has also written at length about this. She's a phenomenal paper from 2002 about this problem that I link in my article. Plenty of other organizations who work on issues of domestic and gendered violence also have resources if you're someone who just wants to learn more or if you do need to seek resources the national network to end domestic violence has plenty of resources on this topic they have a specific safety net project that provides information about technology and stalking and they look at not just people search data brokers, but stalkerware and other technologies uh, that can be vectors for abuse. And so definitely check that out. And there are plenty of others. And and I you know encourage folks to look them up online. You know, the clinic to end tech abuse at Cornell uh, works directly with survivors as well. So there are certainly resources linked in the article that we're talking about. And I would encourage folks to look up some of the ones I just mentioned if you are you know, in need or you just want to learn more uh, from these groups about, about these, these harms. Thanks, Justin. Now, before we wrap up, if there's any final remarks or, or thoughts that you want to share, this is your chance. I think I, I would just say that thinking about people search data brokers and what the companies are doing with data sometimes leads to a conversation about the company's controls, the company's vetting processes. And I think that's a really important question. As mentioned previously in Ms. Boyer's murder, DocuSearch clearly was not in practice, was not doing uh, maybe no vetting or was not doing enough vetting of the person who was buying Ms. Boyer's information the New Hampshire Supreme Court, as mentioned, ruled that they did indeed, in a legal way, violate a, a duty of reasonable care. But I'd also just say, at the same time, we can't overemphasize company controls, right? That's sort of that's a supplement to regulation, right? That's not a replacement for it, because the notion that asking a stalker to not do something illegal with data you're selling them on someone's home address is a preventive measure is just ridiculous that's that is clearly not going to work and so what we need is yes we do need companies to in any sector especially data brokers to who are in business to implement more controls to uh, do more things to make sure they're not selling data to nefarious actors but we also really need systemic legal and regulatory solutions to this problem because as long as these public records exemptions and other carve outs exist in law, these harms are only going to continue to happen. 
Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get an ad-free version of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material Supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jan Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osmond of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>